Welcome to the second lecture on quantum computing. Today we will briefly talk about um, quantum theory and how to use it for computation, not in too much detail. So we will revisit this topic in the third lecture and uh, the following lectures, where we learn about the mathematical fundamentals. Uh, but today still we'll uh, look into quantum physics and quantum theory, how it surrounds us, how it is embedded into the world, into the universe. Um, and I always like to start with this picture here. Um, so what you can see is um, a simulation of the local super of galaxies on Ikea. And uh, it's huge. It encompasses approximately 100,000 galaxies and is stretched out over 160 megaparsecs or 520 million light years. Um, the approximate mass of this monster is about 10 to the 7 solar masses. 100,000 times that of our galaxy. Um, and I show you this because, um, of course, when we look at the galaxies and how they move, and even when we look at uh, planets and stuff, how they move, there is no quantum physics involved. There's only classical predictions, so you can do that completely classically. But then, if we go back in time, about 13.8 billion years, then things are different. Um, so because everything in our universe, our whole universe, was compressed to a very small dot, a very tiny dot. And we can go back in time until the so-called Planck scale. So that's what we can currently calculate and what our current understanding of physics allows us to do. Um, but what happened before is, is very difficult to understand and is unknown. Um, but go back to uh, the Planck scales, look at the Planck length, which is um, about uh, 1.6 to the uh, times 10 to 35 meters, then uh, the classical ideas of space-time, they cease to exist and lose relevance, and quantum physics becomes relevant. And what this tells us is that everything really started with quantum physics. So um, for us, as a computer science uh, as computer science students, and uh, uh, the, we can think about um, the quantum physics, fundamental language of the universe, so the machine language of the universe, and everything sitting on top, all the forces, um, they are higher level uh, functional languages. So how we can look at things. And quantum theory, as I said, it surrounds us. So it has many applications already. Um, starting with um, look at physics. So here, when we look at atoms and molecules, then we're very interested in uh, not only understanding them, but being able to simulate them exactly, because that will give us a way better understanding of um, materials and materials properties. And um, that's one thing. So for example, battery chemistry is one use case uh, where we find this uh, simulating um, the electrochemistry of a battery. Um, it also has medical uses. So if we look at quantum nanoparticles that absorb specific kind of radiation and can attach to, say, cancer cells, then we can make these cancer cells. Um, so that's one, one important use case that we see. It's nothing to do with quantum computing, but it involves quantum physics. Then, of course, we see quantum computing as a very important use case. Lasers is another example. Lasers wouldn't work without understanding quantum theory, so without the coherent emission um, uh, or coherent emission of light. And, emission. and then we have quantum optics and communications. So that's very important, too, um, as we will see. So there are ways to uh, use quantum entanglement to make uh, communication more secure. So still, the example that we will go through will not help you to prevent an attack. But at least it gives you a way to understand if you're currently under attack. And of course, the evolution of the universe. So that's a very important use case. Unfortunately, um, quantum theory um, or quantum technologies in general can not only be used for the good, can be used for the bad. And that applies to, for example, communications. So where uh, current classical encryption algorithms 
are under a threat. And um, another uh, way of uh, applying quantum theories or building bombs or fission. So, you know, uh, nuclear bombs. So that's where quantum theory is interesting and relevant as well. Um, so to put this whole thing in more concrete terms, we have four forces um, in the universe that we currently understand, which is the electromagnetic force. So all the light that we see, including the light that we, so it's not in the optical range. So for example, X-rays, gamma rays, radio waves, microwaves. Um, then we have the weak force, which governs some forms of radioactive decay. We have the strong force, which holds the nuclei together and gravitational force. And for the first three of these, we have uh, a theory in place. For the fourth, we don't. So um, there are some challenges with um, unifying uh, uh, general relativity and quantum theory. Um, so one reason I think I mentioned it the last time was that quantum theory is discrete. So this is one of the challenges. Um, and as a computer scientist, you can look at this as um, the first three or even the fourth one as higher level language as being executed by universe operating according to quantum theory. So look at quantum theory as the machine language of the universe, the most fundamental language. And then we do computing hack into the universe, which is kind of exciting, isn't it? Um, so in physics, people usually don't call these higher level languages, so make up interesting terms such as quantum electrodynamics, but quantum chromodynamics, but this is not of relevance for us. So what are the programs then? The programs are initial conditions that sets the one sets up with particles and fields and such in certain configurations. And that's very true for quantum computing as well. Because in quantum computing, you start with a well-defined state, something you clearly understand, let's say everything in zeros, and then you evolve the system. And that's how you call it in quantum computing. So you have your input register, initial states, and then you evolve it over time and end up with a final configuration that you read out. And um, the program stored on the hard drive is the initial configuration, which when executed enacts a series of changes in the machine. In terms of a gate model chip, these changes are a sequence of gates that you apply to an input state, okay? Um, as for um, Moore's law, so you all have heard about Moore's law, which says that the feature size on silicon chips um, halves approximately every two years. So which means that uh, same chip size, you can double the number of features, transistors, and so exponentially increase the computational power of a chip. And uh, it also becomes cheaper to manufacture such chips. But then if you extrapolate it, <clears throat> let's say until the year 2050, your chips or your computers would be the size of an atom, uh, would be molecules. And what then? So while it's possible to engineer nuclear matter such that you can use it for computation, these computers would get really, really hot and difficult to handle. So there must be another way to increase the computational power. And currently we're looking at quantum computing, which is the, the big savior to this problem. Um, for certain of problems, uh, a quantum computer can be potentially millions of times faster than a classical. Um, but remember, a quantum chip is not made to replace classical chips in every aspect. Quantum chips are always processors. So you take the really tricky, difficult part of a problem, and that's what you solve quantumly. The rest can still be done classically. Also, there is no need to replace all classical chips with quantum chips. Why, for example, would you need a quantum bra? Um, to surf or browse the internet. So that's not needed. Um, <clears throat> where quantum internet is a different story. So just to make sure <laughs> um, that uh, that you hear too. So our encryption um, is secure. So our communication is again secure. Um, so many institutions um, make million and even billion dollar investments such as Google, Rigetti, D-Wave, IBM, NASA, the European Union, Microsoft, and um, also companies such as Volkswagen um, are making relevant contributions these days. So it's, it's, I think now is the time to really start thinking about quantum computing in industry 
and uh, think about the use cases, solve down versions of the problems that we see in industry and be ready when we have the chips that are powerful enough to solve these problems on an industrial scale level. Um, then why are quantum computers so powerful um, compared to classical computers? Um, for this, we need to understand some of the quantum effects used in computing. And um, so you see these cartoons here on the right. This is not a technical explanation of things. We will go into more detail later, but um, just that you have heard of it. Um, so the first one is uh, the quantum linear superposition. Um, when you look into classical information theory, then the smallest unit of information is the bit. And uh, usually what a computer does or a program does is operate on a string of bits. Um, and the interesting thing now is if you stop the computation while it's going, so in between, before you reach the end of the computation, um, it usually doesn't harm the process. You can read out the intermediate result and continue the computation um, to a later point in time. So that doesn't harm the computation. But it's different with quantum computing. In quantum computing, you always have a direct connection to physics. You implement the respective bits called quantum bits. So here too, we have quantum bits uh, that can take certain states. So we don't say they take value, take states. Um, and the states are, uh, so for a single quantum bit, zero and one. And um, the interesting thing now is, as long as you don't look at it, so continue your computation, then one single quantum bit can be in a superposition, can be zero and one at once. So each of these um, configurations, so zero or one, each of these states is associated with a probability amplitude. Um, we'll learn more about that later, but um, um, so I should say it's a probability that when you look at it, it either collapses into zero or into one. But as long as you don't look at it, it's both at once. So I mentioned this direct connection to physics, uh, which means um, there are different ways of implementing quantum bits. Um, say you have an electronic spin, that's a way of implementing a quantum bit, spin up and spin down can be your zero and one. You have uh, the superconducting uh, rings that we talked about before, so the squids, uh, superconducting quantum interference device, where you induce current in a ring and then you generate two magnetic fields, one up and one down, that can be your zero and one, and many other ways of implementing that. Uh, but suffice to say, the interesting thing is here that as long as you don't look at it, interact with it, um, you have this superposition. So meaning um, this one bit is not in a definite state. It is in a superposition state. And that generalizes to multiple bits, of course. And that's the interesting thing here. So let's say I have two bits and each can take two states, zero and one two quantum bits. So then I have two to the power of two equals four possible configurations. This system can exist or can uh, assume at one point in time, so in a superposition. And uh, now the interesting thing is if I add one bit, then I still have two um, possible states per bit. So still two to the power of three so, um, equals eight um, possible configurations of that system at once. So if you look at um, that in terms of solutions to your problem, then you could look at eight solutions to a problem um, at once. So if you look at it the right way, you'll get the solution to your problem, um, but you only look at it, uh, so you look at them while they coexist. It's different from a classical computer. With a classical computer, if you had eight solutions, so the worst uh, case scenario would be you have to test all eight sequentially to find the best solution to your problem. You can, of course, parallelize. You can take two times four and I then um, run through each of these uh, four solutions. But worst case scenario, still, you have to check all eight. So that means the sequential processing. Whereas with quantum computing, it's different. And I know this is difficult to grasp when you hear it the first time, is solutions coexist. And uh, it depends on how you look at it. So how you read it out, um, if you find the right solution to your problem. There are a couple of other things that are uh, that need to be done, but the whole artistry 
is really to create this superposition state that encodes possible solutions to your problem and then look at it the right way. So read out the correct solution to your problem. Um, then the superposition alone would be of no use if you had, let's say, 1000 qubits um, and they wouldn't be connected, they wouldn't be able to interact with each other, then this wouldn't be of uh, any use because then you would, uh, in fact, have 1000 single qubit systems. So we need a way to correlate these bits. I need to be able to do something to one bit and influence arbitrarily many other bits. So in theory, in practice, it's uh, kind of different because of the chip topologies that we see, but also more on that later. So, and this is called entanglement. And entanglement, uh, if you think about it in classical terms, um, is sort of a correlation, but it's uh, stronger than normal correlation. And um, the interesting thing now is, so let's say I entangle two bits, um, I take one uh, or both bits in this room here, in this very room, um, I correlate them, entangle them, and I do something to one bit, say set the one bit to one, then I can make the other immediately jump to one, two, or jump to, th to zero, depending on how I entangle these two bits. And the interesting thing here is that this happens without time delay, instantaneously. And now if I still have one of these entangled qubits in that room and the other one up in Andromeda galaxy, 770 kiloparsecs away, um, if I still do something to that one qubit, the other one will feel its effect immediately without time delay. Now, some of you might think this violates special relativity because nothing can move faster than light, but it's not. So there is a mathematical proof. So look up Bell's theorem if you're interested. Uh, there's a mathematical proof that says um, there is no transport of information. So also no light um, between these entangled bits is transported. So um, it's something different. And uh, we understood enough of it that we can use it to build a computer. So we have superposition and entanglement. And then the third effect that's currently only used in quantum annealing systems uh, in combination with the other two is tunneling. And tunneling um, is very interesting too. So that's why quantum annealing systems, I'll explain a little, uh, well, quantum annealing systems uh, use it because it's particularly useful for solving optimization problems. Think about um, solutions to an optimization problem as follows. You have a landscape um, right now in 3D space. So we have a landscape with hills and valleys and um, you have... Uh, solutions to your optimization problem that you want to solve. And the good solutions, they're in the valleys, and the bad solutions, they're on the hilltops. And um, so what a classical algorithm can now do is it can start uh, walking on this surface anywhere. So it can start walking up and down. And after some time, it will be in a valley and will, if you uh, give it a time constraint or some other constraint, will probably tell you, well, this is the best solution I can find. So, um, and, and I'll put that solution to you. But is it really the globally best solution or only the locally best solution? Um, the algorithm may not know. And it's different with um, tunneling because also here um, we have these hills and valleys. It's energy barriers that we're talking about here. So it's an energy surface. Um, and um, if you do it right, your chip can tunnel through these energy barriers. So that's the interesting thing here. And what that means is it will just fly through these energy barriers, fly through the hills and valleys, and end up in the global minimum. So it will find you the best solution to your problem. And how this works, uh, we'll learn about this, uh, more about this a little later. But um, remember, these are the three effects that don't have a classical counterpart. And these are the three effects so there is another one, interference, but um, it's not used for computation in most of the current implementations. So it's actually something you want to get rid of because interference can um, be constructive and deconstructive, but then it interferes you with, with your computation. But anyway, so remember these three. These are the most important ones um, for current chip um, technologies, quantum chip technologies, which are, by the way, called quantum processing units or QPU. Um, now, why are we interested in, in quantum computing? Um, so in 
back in 1936, remember our last lecture when we talked about um, uh, Alan Turing and his predecessors? So in 1936, only uh, a few people thought about programmable computers. And then there was this one paper uh, released by Alan Turing on uh, computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem. And um, so that really kicked off the, the whole field of, of computer science and programmable computers. And what we uh, see is that quantum computers are hardware and software with fundamentally uh, new integrated circuits that store and process quantum information. So that's important here because um, compared to a classical chip where you uh, store the data uh, separately, a quantum chip um, stores and so you, talk, you say we call this embedding, embeds the data on the chip and then solves the problem also on the chip. So quantum chips are, are um, storage and chip at once, so in one device. Um, and what we just learned before, that every additional qubit on a chip doubles its computational power. And we learned about some effects. There is a superposition, entanglement, interference. We will keep that out and have tunneling too. Okay. Um, and why we look at this is because with today's computers, most of the uh, the most interesting and most important problems can and will never be solved. And it's not only today, so if we extrapolate what's possible with current uh, classical hardware, when we extrapolate this a couple decades, still most of the interesting problems cannot be solved. And there must be a solution to that, which is currently quantum computing. Um, here I have a couple of classes, problem classes. Um, this is by no means complete, but this is um, this is uh, the area or other areas that most people are looking into these days. So one group of uh, applications is transportation and logistics, where we always have a time component. So if you solve traffic flow, for example, you want to do that as quickly as possible. So imagine you collect position data of vehicles every one to five seconds, then your algorithm shouldn't take an hour to solve the redistribution problem. So ideally, within that um, data collection interval, you can also solve that problem. But if you have, uh, so if you have 10 vehicles, 20 vehicles, that's still easy. You can do that on your phone. But if you have 1 million vehicles, then the story is different. So, or even hundred thousands of vehicles, it's different. So you cannot solve this problem with a classical computer in seconds. It's not possible. So that's why we have a hope here for quantum computing. And we can show that it works today with quantum annealing systems. Uh, and by comparing it to classic algorithms, we sometimes see advantages. So well, that's really important because that means we have applications already today. Uh, that doesn't mean you cannot solve these problems with a classical computer, but it takes longer. Um, and uh, I have uh, this one use case, traffic optimization, that I will continue to talk about a little later today. Then um, another problem or two problems that are really interesting are artificial intelligence and neuroscience. So the first one, if we look into artificial intelligence, specifically the subfield of machine learning, which is one pillar of AI, then um, uh, one thing you do is you train algorithms. So you have some data, some X, and um, you don't specifically program the L, so program uh, your, your program to do something specific. You have the algorithm learn from the data. You take your x's and then you have some y's, something you want to predict. Um, and uh, what happens in between is the machine learning algorithm that creates a mapping between these x's and y's. One good example is, uh, sort of a, a complex example, is behavioral cloning in self-driving vehicles, uh, which is done by um, neural networks. But so what happens is that if you imagine your vehicle, uh, it senses a lot. So it has your, it has the cameras. It has LiDAR, uh, it has ultrasound, it has radar. Um, um, and then you combine this input data stream, so that's your axis. And then you record the driver's behavior. So what does the driver do based on his input stream? So you record the movement of the steering wheel, acceleration, braking maneuvers, gear shifts. So whatever you can get. And um, this is called behavioral cloning. So these are your Ys. So based on the input data stream, uh, you have your neural network sitting in the middle, creating a mapping to your output data stream. 
And this is a fairly complex model. So even with uh, supercomputers, this may take up to a week to do one complete training cycle based on the data we already collected. And that's challenging because in the end, what you always want is innovate fast and have so quick innovation cycles. So um, if you can speed that up somehow, that's a huge competitive advantage. And that's what we're after. So you really want to uh, be able to, to speed training up. And with quantum computers, and this is just one example, we take the tricky part in a neural network, which can be the search for, for weights, and try to solve that quantumly. Or imagine the gradient descent that you apply for training a neural network. With an adiabatic quantum computer, which is uh, an optimizer, uh, you can just replace um, the gradient descent uh, or use the atom optimizer or whatever you use and replace it with um, an adiabatic uh, quantum computer and solve that quantumly. So you see, it's only one part of a classical algorithm that we solve quantumly. So that's why most of the algorithms that we're interested in and look into are quantum classical. So you call them quantum enhanced or quantum assisted algorithms. The other thing that's really interesting is neuroscience. Um, that's nothing to do with quantum computing. I just mentioned it um, to be complete here. So, um, as we, as we said before, the whole world, as we understand it, is based on quantum physics. And that means uh, no matter if it's the chair I'm sitting on right now or the table um, I'm sitting at or my brain. So everything should be based on quantum physics. Um, but it's very challenging to verify that and get a detailed understanding um, of that behavior. Uh, so especially when you have living tissue, it's very difficult um, to to uh, verify if there's quantum behavior involved. But the assumption is if I'm able to simulate um, my a brain quantumly, uh, so if you're down to the atom, um, then you can also or would also be able to rebuild um, the whole thing or simulate the whole thing. And another example that I have is uh, when we look at our cells. So, you know, we are made of eukaryotic cells. So there are prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and we are made of eukaryotic cells. and there's no difference if that is a liver cell or a brain cell, it's still a eukaryotic cell. And um, there's a one-celled organism called the paramecium. And the paramecium, as I said, is only one cell. Um, it can learn to swim around obstacles, it can learn to avoid enemies, and it can learn to find food. Now the question, of course, comes up, how is that possible? Because it's only one cell, and the assumption that we have is that um, our neural network, our brain, it only works as such because it's a network of cells. So it's a 100 billion cells uh, working together. So how can then be one single cell achieve such feats as, as avoiding obstacles or finding food? Well, there is one theory that says there is quantum behavior involved. So if we look at it under the microscope, uh, and look at this cell, then you will see that it has um, a cytoskeleton, so a skeleton around the cell. And if we go even deeper, then we will understand that in this cytoskeleton, there are some structural components. And one structural component is called the tubulin dimere. And the tubulin dimere, um, as, I, as the name indicates, is a tube. Um, and the walls are made up of dimeres, just means uh, you have particles that can take two states, two configurations. And um, the, uh, it's, it seems like or looks almost like a peanut. So, and this peanut, if you imagine it, um, can be either open or closed, so with both ends touching each other. And it seems if this peanut is, so the, the, the dimeres, if they're closed, then they're just thick enough to isolate quantum effects. Um, and that's now interesting, because if we then would be able to, to understand if quantum effects happen in that dimer, in, uh, in, that, in that tube, uh, then if that would be the case, there could be a possibility that entanglement happens over these um, uh, tubulin dimers. And that's, that's really interesting because that would indicate that we have a sort of invisible neural network um, in these structure components. And um, there are a couple of theories out there where um, some people claim um, the collapse of a quantum superposition may be a conscious experience, but um, we don't want to um, get too far away from quantum computing. So it's just something to keep in mind um, and something where quantum um, technologies um, in the future um, may be able to help understand how the mind works, how the brain works. 
Then the next thing, uh, we briefly talked about it already, is simulated physics, material science. So in simulated physics, or what we do here is simulating molecules and atoms. And um, we do this in order to gain a better understanding of chemistry and materials, um, to build structures that are currently, uh, that we can't currently build because the materials lack, for example, tensile strength, um, or to improve uh, battery chemistry. That's another good example to understand uh, the behavior or how drugs react to proteins is another very good example. And then I'm already at the last point here, which is medicine. So um, these problems so in medicine and simulated physics, they're very similar. So you want to do, you basically want to understand how one molecule um, behaves quantum physically. So with current simulations, just so you know, um, the challenge is in simulating all the interactions. So you if you add an electron to, let's say you have a diatomic molecule with a couple electrons, if you add an electron to that, you have to simulate the quantum behavior with all the other electrons on the nuclei. And usually what you do with classical computers is you make some assumptions. So for example, you say that the nuclei don't move, um, but they do move. Um, so it's an approximation. They're just a lot slower than the electrons, but the assumption that we one assumption that we make classically is they don't move, so we make them static. And uh, so the more approximations you make, the less accurate your simulation becomes, the less you learn something useful about your material because you're not simulating it accurately. You're not simulating nature. And um, so if you want to do a simulation, it better be quantum um, because nature is quantum, as Feynman said. Uh, now let's look at two different architectures, the current most currently most interesting ones that we have and see and, and have to our avail, which is quantum annealing and gate model, gate model slash universal quantum computer. If you look um, at the left side here, so on the left side, um, so everything here, uh, that is uh, quantum annealing. What you see here on top, um, this H of S here is the Hamiltonian, um, is the Ising spin model. So you have two terms um, that um, indicate the importance of each of the of the first and second two terms in this equation here on the right, um, and they change over time. Um, but this Ising spin model, um, so what you see here is the interaction. So you have um, these qubits here, the qubits here, and uh, you have the interaction term in the qubit, you have the diagonal terms here. Um, so we can uh, find the mathematical equivalent, and that's the one here um, below. The classical optimization problem, the corresponding optimization problem is called QBO, which is quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. And you already see the similarities here, so still you have your A's, B's, and Q's, and um, uh, the QI, QJ here means qubit I and qubit J, so BIJ means the interaction between these qubits, so we talked about entanglement before, um, that's um, the entanglement term that we talked about, then you have the diagonal terms here, and one important thing is here, I is smaller than J, so which means um, what you produce here is an upper triangular matrix. So if we look at it here and say we have a matrix here, then only this one here, this upper half here, is uh, filled. Um, and uh, that's how you submit the problem to an API, which uh, then converts it to an Ising spin model, which is what the chip does. So the chip is an Ising spin model, so a quantum annealing system. So this is the the natural problem on top, but um, you formulate it as a binary optimization problem. And um, we'll look um, um, at this in more detail later, but um, this one here, when you have the bij and the qi and qj, so you can imagine uh, this with a practical example. Say we have a traffic flow optimization problem, and um, we want to uh, simulate the interaction, or we want to place a vehicle at some other position than this vehicle here. Vehicle I has interactions with the vehicle J and a couple other vehicles. So um, that's where the interaction strength um, becomes important. Okay. 
uh, for the gate model chip here on the right, um, we uh, uh, implement an algorithm differently. So it's not a matrix. It's a sequence of gates that you implement. Um, so if we uh, think about classical computing, you still, you also have gates. So for example, the AND gate, OR gate, NOT AND gate, etc., X OR gate. So these are classical gates. You also have quantum gates, um, uh, theoretically an infinite number of gates, but we only need a limited subset of gates that we look at. Um, and um, But the, the, the uh, thought behind this is the same. So one important thing that we will talk a lot about later is that um, uh, quantum computing, so gate model is reversible. So if we apply a gate twice um, to the same state, um, then what, what happens is, is that you get back the original state. Um, let's look at this. Uh, this is just an example. So if you um, um, don't know what I'm talking about right now, fear not, we'll, we'll talk about all this in a lot more detail later. As I said, I have this iterative approach where I introduce a concept and then we'll revisit it later and learn more about it. Um, the example gate that we have here is a Hadamard gate uh, represented by the bold um, and italic H here. And uh, the Hadamard gate, um, if we um, implement it as a matrix, uh, is, is this. Um, and I mentioned it before, the language of quantum computing, for gate model chips at least, is a linear algebra. And any uh, gate that we apply is um, a matrix. And so if we apply that, to the state zero, for example, um, let me write that down here. So the state zero in that case, um, this is a vectorial representation, is given by one zero and the state one is given by zero one, okay? And now if we apply um, that Hallamart gate to the state zero, which means in, in that case, um, we apply, one, one, minus one, to state one, zero, then um, what we get as a result is one over uh, square root of two and one over square root of two. So we have these two elements, um, and that means exactly, oops, sorry, um, what do you see here? Uh, which is um, half the probability of the state being zero and half the probability of the state being one, which is also what you see here. So half the probability of state zero and half one. And in case you're wondering why we have square root over two, um, it's because usually there's amplitudes, so it's not probabilities that we see here, it's probability amplitudes. Um, they are complex numbers. So we need to square them to get the probabilities. If you square one over the square root of two, it's one half. And uh, if you ask why that is, um, this is because what we observe, this is how nature has given it to us and this is how we observe it in experiment. And the same uh, is true if you apply it for to the state one. So what you see here is a different uh, relative phase. So relative phase means um, if you change that plus to that minus one, so only for one of these states in the global phase, you would see that around that whole state here. So for the, the global phase doesn't change um, the, the state, but the relative phase does. So if you see a plus here and the minus here, that's a difference. And now what happens here, if you um, apply that Hadamard gate to uh, that state one, so which would be in that case um, on the upper left corner right now. I again take one and the square root of two, and I do one, one, one minus one, and apply that to the state one. Um, you will end up with one over square root of two minus one over square root of two, okay? Um, which then again is this one here. 
um, and apply it twice. So please give it a try. If you apply it twice, you will get back the original state. So applying the Hallmark gate again will give you, um, ideally, if you do it right, for one, zero, one, a vector. And in case if you're wondering about this here, um, this notation here, uh, this is called the bracket notation. So what you see here is a cat vector. Um, uh, so uh, we'll learn about bras and cats later on, but this is just a vectorial representation. So in the end, this is just a way of describing states. So it could also be Haramat applied to uh, five degrees to the west. You can give it any name, but it's important to understand what vector lies underneath it. So it's of course easier for a state zero to remember um, the zero vector. One, zero, uh, same for one here. And um, so what this does here, um, you may have guessed it. So if you have this probability for each of the states here, uh, so from one definite state, zero in that case, you end up with a probability of that state being zero and the probability of that state being one, which is the superposition that we talked about before. So now you know how to do that and that generalizes to multiple qubits, okay? Um, let's continue. So one definition that I want to emphasize on and that's particularly important to me is useful quantum supremacy. Um, quantum supremacy is this one experiment, as I mentioned before, uh, that shows that you can do something with a quantum computer that you cannot do with a classical computer and that everyone is after. But um, Sometimes we construct arbitrary mathematical experiments. So things that are of no practical use. So I'm a strong proponent of doing things that are useful. Um, and um, so while uh, the quantum supremacy experiment on an arbitrary mathematical problem, something, an artificial mathematical problem um, is academically of course valuable, uh, the practical use is questionable. So we wanna think about uh, useful quantum supremacy, which can be, for example, being able to simulate um, a molecule of industrial relevance, something that really lets me uh, solve a problem that we have in industry. Um, and we're not, not there yet. So as I said before, uh, what we can do is um, sometimes solve the problem a little faster with an annealing system compared to a classical algorithm. But um, it's not the case that we solve industry relevant problems with quantum computers that cannot be solved with classical computers at all, but we will get there. So this is the big hope of quantum computing. If we look at uh, uh, algorithms, then um, we have certain types of algorithms. Uh, so if you look at that chart here on the right, um, then we distinguish between the type of data and type of algorithm which is um, on the upper left corner is the data is classical and the algorithm is classical. So that means, uh, say I do this problem that I mentioned before, behavioral cloning, I have classical data. So this input data stream that my car or the vehicle sees is definitely not quantum and the algorithm solving it is today also not quantum assisted. Um, then if we go uh, to the right here and look at CQ, then um, this still means I have classical data. Let's stick with that problem. But I train that neural network quantumly. So I have um, a classical data source and I train it quantumly. <clears throat> Here on the bottom left, um, if the data is quantum and you do it classically, then an example is molecule simulation. So you have quantum data and have classical algorithms and have to use classical algorithms to solve that problem. And QQ, um, that's um, the killer application. So you have data that's quantum and you have an algorithm that's quantum to solve it. Um, here on the left, um, that's still true um, for um, gate model chips. So it's up to 50, uh, 50 physical qubits. So we, we uh, hear about uh, universal gate model chips where you have up to 100 qubits, um, but we haven't seen them as of today. And uh, it's very important to distinguish between physical 
and logical qubits here in gate model chips. For annealing systems, this is not relevant, but um, for uh, gate model chips, it is relevant. So a physical bit means the bits on the chip. So if I have uh, a quantum chip with 100 qubits, then these are the 100 physical qubits. But then these qubits are not perfect. You may have to summarize uh, a couple bits to simulate one logical qubit, to give you one logical qubit. And how many of them do you need? The less, the better, because the less um, qubits you need on the chip. But um, it's always important to ask that question. How many physical qubits make up my logical qubits? And this is not true anymore. So right now we're at 5,000 qubits here. And uh, the difference is uh, also that hybrid solvers um, became very important. Hybrid. Hybrid solvers um, that can now solve up to uh, 1 million binary variables, um, accessing the quantum chip if needed only. So 5,000 uh, qubits for annealing systems and hybrid solvers that can solve up to 1 million um, binary variables. So problems with up to 1 million binary problems, uh, variables. Good. And most promising for right now um, are these things that everyone is looking into is quantum assisted machine learning, such as the augmentation of deep learning, reinforcement learning, optimization algorithms, sampling, then simulation. And as a, a fourth one here, um, so these go together. And as a fourth one here, I would just add optimization and here, um, I mean, of course, we have a strong overlap with uh, machine learning because many of the problems in machine learning that we try to solve are also optimization problems or can at least be converted into an optimization problem. But I would consider it uh, as, a seg as a separate segment here. So that's also what people look into. Machine learning, optimization, simulation. Simulation is uh, simulating molecules. Okay. And now I brought some real world examples that we can uh, look into. Uh, this is a summary slide and uh, you see I added courtesy of Volkswagen here below. Uh, everything is published um, and this is not because I want to advertise the company I work for. Um, still, uh, it's very interesting what I do there, but it's not that I uh, specifically want to advertise this. It's just that I developed or we developed this in the context of Volkswagen Group and it's published, so we can talk about it, but it's provided by Volkswagen Group in that uh, case. So, and what you can see here, um, these two videos um, is a traffic flow optimization example. On the top here, um, you see um, the traffic situation in the city of Beijing. Uh, so um, it was 10,000 taxis that we used. It's a publicly available data set, the T-Drive data set. And um, it shows these red spots here, um, it shows where uh, traffic jams occur or minimization of traffic flow occurs. And uh, at the bottom, uh, you see the quantum assisted optimization. So where we predict traffic jams and before the vehicles really get there, uh, we resolve the traffic jam. But let's look at that into, in more detail. Um, so for traffic flow optimization, um, the, uh, the algorithm itself is a quantum classical algorithm so that we developed. And what we do is, so classically do a sort of survival data mining, predict uh, where traffic jams will happen 10, 15 minutes um, in the future, and then um, take the vehicles that we analyze, contribute to that traffic jam, to causing the traffic jam, and optimize the positions of these vehicles. So before they really cause this traffic jam, we optimize the position such that the traffic jam doesn't happen at all. And um, one crucial thing here is that we don't calculate the individually best routes for these vehicles. So this is what very often happens in navigation systems. Um, the navigation system will tell you, well, there's a traffic jam ahead, go right, take this exit here but it doesn't consider all the other vehicles that do the same thing. So 300 vehicles will go to the right and cause traffic jam there. And that's why 
The problem that uh, we solved here is a lot more complex. So anytime we redistribute vehicles, we do this under the consideration of all other vehicles that they can potentially influence. It's not um, a good solution if we take 100 vehicles that we predict will contribute to a traffic jam and move them somewhere else, and so they will cause traffic jam there. That's not what we want. That's not what we are after. Um, so and this is why this problem is so complex. So imagine you have three possible routes per vehicle, and you predict, so it's a small number, only 500 vehicles contribute to a traffic jam. Um, then the solution space to this problem, so how you can redistribute um, these vehicles in the worst case is three to the power of 500, which is huge. So uh, a classical computer will not be able to evaluate that as fast as a quantum computer. Um, so and even worse, so if you have thousands of vehicles, so the, the hope still is that with a quantum computer you achieve a linear scaling, whereas with growing input data side with a classical algorithm, you may not achieve that. Um, one other thing that's particularly interesting um, is quantum assisted reinforcement learning. And this is a huge research area right now. This was the first publication that we uh, released a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, you know reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is uh, a class of algorithms in uh, artificial intelligence that learn based on experience. And um, that can be real experience or simulated experience. But imagine, for example, a robot that wants to move through a room. Um, what you can do now is um, have that robot give it a couple tries. So anytime it ends up in a dead end or uh, gets stuck and um, uh, it doesn't uh, move or reach the goal um, in a certain time, you can say this is a bad solution. So you can punish algorithmically um, the robot for taking such a solution. But you can then, on the other hand, reward uh, the robot for good solutions. Anytime it reaches the goal fast, then you can reward the actions that it took to reach that goal. And another example that I have here is um, self-driving vehicles uh, when it wants to learn parking maneuvers. What you can do is execute 1 million parking maneuvers and record everything that you can record as uh, an experience. At any time in the parking maneuver, um, you make a mistake. So hit the hydrant or do not park optimally. So the vehicle isn't straight in the parking lot. Then you can say this is a bad solution. I will punish my algorithm for learning that, um, for doing it. And then the good solutions is the perfect parking maneuvers. So those are the ones that I really want. Um, so all the actions that result in bad um, in the parking maneuvers are punished and the good ones are rewarded. Now, you can do that with a driver, of course, so have a driver and do that one million times, but also um, simplify that a little. So, for example, do a simulation. So let the vehicle simulate its behavior, simulate parking maneuvers one million times. And uh, from this simulation, um, you can then uh, let the algorithm learn the optimal parking maneuver. And the goal here in that project was to um, so what you, what you like you call it the policy, the optimal policy, which is the optimal behavior. Um, so based on a limited set of experience, you can never simulate everything that can happen in the world based on limited set of experiences. For example, a limited number of parking maneuvers that you record, um, you should be able to generalize to all situations. So and then do a parking maneuver in any given situation and do it as good as it can. And the idea now was um, to learn this optimal policy and speed up the learning. Um, instead, uh, we achieved a very interesting result. So the quantum chip in that case, um, uh, I wanted to embed it. Uh, remember, I wanted to embed these state action combinations um, on the chip. But what happened was that it um, filtered out always two thirds of the state action combinations of the episodes. And it was really interesting. So no matter if I feed it 100, 1,000, or 1 million, it will always filter out approximately two-thirds of the observations. And um, so if I only take the remainder of the observations and train a classical reinforcement learning algorithm, then the result would be comparably good to as when I would have trained the algorithm on uh, 1 million, uh, so all the 100% of um, observation or episodes. And that's that's interesting. So it still needs further investigation, but you see um, this can be um, 
significant game changer in reinforcement learning. And there's a lot more research going on. So one other algorithm that we published was just to use the topology of a chip. So if you imagine uh, looking um, onto a quantum chip, so look at it from the top. And um, it's a 2D grid. It's, uh, it looks like uh, almost like a neural network. So it has uh, the, the qubits. So in, in that case, I'm talking about superconducting chip, which are the rings of metals. And then you have the connections between the qubits. So it almost looks like a neural network. And the natural question that arises is, of course, can I embed a neural network, so to say quantum neural network? Um, so, and one thing um, that we did here was uh, find a clustering algorithm. So randomly initialize the chip with random uh, qubit values and entanglement values. And <clears throat> then um, have it react uh, to unknown, um, unknown traffic. So the, the problem that we looked at here was network traffic. And um, still, uh, you would get a set of qubits activated. And so the output of a quantum chip is always a vector, a long vector of numbers, so which looks sort of um, sort of like this, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on. So which is, um, you can say this is the qubit number 1, this is the qubit number 2, qubit number 3, etc. So while in superposition before, in all possible configurations uh, that these can take, um, the result is always one definite uh, solution. So you always get one, one definite result out there. Um, and that's what we looked at um, with clustering. So we used the chip topology, and uh, in the end, we would get activations for unknown behavior. And that was really interesting. So it was self, sort of a self-organizing map um, where, you know, self-organizing map, which are very useful for handwritten digits recognition, for example. But um, here we, we applied it to um, network traffic to see abnormalities. And we still don't know if this is an attack or not, but it is very helpful to, to do that fast and to understand if um, there is something I need to look into more detail. So you see also here, we have already an application. So one thing that we recently um, published and released was a quantum assisted paint shop. And this is also specifically um, uh, a critical result. Uh, here, um, we took, um, data of vehicles, so in the assembly. And um, the question now is, is can I minimize the number of color changes in the paint shop? And uh, so if we look at it, um, we start with a binary version. Um, so every car gets a coating before it gets the final color. And the coating is always, coating is always black or white. So depending on if it's a lighter color, that's the final color, then the coating will be white, otherwise it will be black. And now the question was, so for identical models in that sequence, um, can I optimize um, these color switches, so minimize the color switches um, without switching the sequence of vehicles? Because that's something to do with production planning. I cannot switch the number of vehicles. But what I can do is um, optimize the color switches. So and that's what we did here. And uh, why you want to do that is because anytime you do a color switch in production, this uh, costs money because changing the color in the paint shop means <clears throat> in the end, you have to change hardware. You have to change the nozzles. Um, and every hardware change costs money. Which is why you want to avoid hardware changes. And that's what we could show here. So. I don't know if you can see it, I'll zoom in. Um, so originally, um, for that day, we had 288 um, color switches um, and optimized it down to 45. And uh, so that means per color switch, instead of only serving on average 2.6 cars, we can now serve 16.8 cars which is a very remarkable result. So this means we can save a lot of money in the paint shop. And uh, this is not a problem that I need to solve um, that has a time component that I need to solve really fast. But we could show that solving it with a quantum annealing system is possible. And now we test it in production so, and it works. So that's really interesting. Um, 
the other example that I have, and I encourage you to, to look into that too, we have a publication about that out too, is um, a layer-wise learning for quantum artificial neural networks uh, published together with Google. And the motivation here um, was to optimize the resource usage on the near-term quantum devices for training quantum neural networks. So you see the number of qubits that we have to our avail on quantum chips um, in the near future is very limited. So we want to make optimal use of that. And uh, the method reduces the runtime on the quantum processing unit and tackles a fundamental problem in neural network training. So let's us uh, train circuits with more qubits and layers. So um, this is one of the most interesting research directions for using near-term quantum devices in machine learning. For electronic structure calculations, so here what we do is um, we'll look into um, simulating <coughs> molecules. So um, that's what we talked about before briefly. Um, so what you see here on the right um, is that the molecules can be described by a fermionic Hamiltonian. So a Hamiltonian um, is um, a function describing the energy, so having kinetic and potential energy of a system. Um, and um, that's the function that you can see here with the interaction terms. And um, so the HIJ and HIJKL are the one and two electron integrals for a specific interatomic distance R. So you have the distance here. And um, the creation and annihilation operators are given by A um, dagger I and A sub I here. Okay. And um, because quantum chips uh, use qubits, there must be a mapping from the fermionic creation and annihilation operators to uh, the qubit operators. And there is a Brevi-Kitaev or Jordan-Wigner, so Jordan-Wigner transformation, and that one is Brevi-Kitaev that you can look into if you're interested, um, that allows you to do that mapping. Um, so what we do is we have that sigma x, sigma y, sigma z terms instead of sigma z, z terms only, and k local terms instead of two local. And here is the mapping that we do. Um, so how that mapping works. And uh, we end up um, uh, with this uh, one here, so which you remember from before, looks very similar to um, the Cubo problem that we looked at. So, and this is because we solved this problem on the quantum annealing system. So you have um, the interaction terms here and um, the two local representation given by um, the sigma z, sigma uh, ij terms here. So here's an example how that looks on a chip. So a couple of example simulations, and that one was H804. Um, what you can see here is, is an example solution on the chip. Um, here you see the solution legend. Um, so this is just the topology that you see that the qubit um, are arranged in cells of eight. So this is a previous generation of a D-Wave system. <clears throat> and uh, the solution legend just gives you the qubit value. And uh, I'll quickly uh, jump over that. So for electronic structure calculations, so here we have lithium hydride, beryllium oxide, classical, and the quantum computing calculation over different bond lengths. So here, what you see on the bottom is the bond length given in angstrom and um, the number of seconds here on top. So this is uh, time t, the number of seconds it took to simulate um, the respective molecule with different bond lengths. And um, <clears throat> so you can see um, the, the blue one represents the lithium hydride full configuration interaction. So this is the full interaction, uh, purely classical simulation. Then you have beryllium oxide, full classic, uh, full configuration interaction, purely classical. And uh, you have the quantum simulation. So in the quantum simulation is um, uh, shows that time is really constant. So uh, not varying too much with different bond lengths. Um, same here uh, for H2O, um, different bond lengths. 
And uh, what you can see here is um, the electronic structure calculations uh, with an artificial neural network correction. So that's a slightly different problem um, where you have um, the quantum computing calculations. So given with these red dots, the D-Wave system, then uh, the dotted blue one is the Hartree Fock, the black one is the full configuration, and the blue uh, the, the green uh, dots is the simulated one. So, and you see that the simulation here on the left with the lithium hydride um, is very uh, close to what the D-Wave system gives you, but the uh, full configuration interaction, that's um, the, the full classical um, simulation, that's what we really want. Um, the same here, uh, so it's a little off when you can see here, the same here on the right, okay? And now what we did was, again, uh, do a combination with uh, classical algorithms, so in that case, neural networks. So we take the prediction given by the quantum computer, and um, then we have, with the simulations that we can also do classically, train neural network that it corrects for um, the offset here. And um, the complete prediction um, that, um, sorry, the complete predictions, I hear my dog barking in the background. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, so the complete um, FCI prediction is given in red here. Another example that I brought is the finite elements method here, which is also very useful for embedding it on a quantum chip, um, or very, very interesting for embedding it on a quantum chip. And the goal here was to uh, come up with a solution for uh, finite elements. So really show that uh, you can optimize design of components, design of parts partially quantumly. And what you see here um, in this uh, graphic here on the right, so it was done by the way by Dion van Vermingen who also studied here uh, at the University of Leiden and who did an internship uh, with Volkswagen Group of America in San Francisco. And uh, what he what he did was he took um, the, uh, sorry, or let's start differently. So imagine you have um, an exterior mirror on a vehicle and you want to minimize the wind noise on the passenger seat. So how do you do that? Um, what you do is um, you make a, a finite elements design, so do a mesh um, basically of that mirror, and you change the shape of the mirror, still preserving its properties, so it must still be a mirror in the end, and um, change the shape such that um, the uh, acoustic waves, so that cause um, or that, that uh, give you that wind noise on the driver's seat, are just deflected to other places, so just not hit the driver's seat. And that's what we simulate here. So on the right, you see a sphere. And um, you see this area here, so you can imagine that this area, um, that's the passenger seat. So ideally, none of these rays hit back at the passenger seat. So you can move around that, um, um, that source of that noise, that source of the um, acoustic spherical wave. Um, we did an approximation here, so it's now a ray casting problem. It's not really a spherical acoustic wave anymore. But still, it's a good approximation. So we can take um, the reflections from that sphere and see where this goes and not change the shape of the sphere such that nothing hits that area here. And so that's what we want to do. Now, um, so that's the original problem. We had an acoustic monopole here emitting a spherical wave. And uh, here you have a couple of microphones around um, your shape, um, around our shape that we had. So here we had uh, the, the original sphere. So this is just uh, the test element. Of course, there's not an external mirror, but this is a test element. If it works with that one, it will work with any other shape too. So there's reflecting surface elements and based on which microphone we activate, um, we want to make sure that we change the shape of the sphere such that nothing um, is reflected uh, from the sphere to that microphone, okay? which in, in our case would be in the exterior mirror case would be the passenger seat. And um, I'll jump over that. Let me um, show you. So this is 
uh, one example uh, where we have the optimized shape already. So you see the emission here behind that surface. It's hitting the optimized shape um, and the reflections, they do not go back on this area here, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, but still, we maximally preserved the shape of the sphere. So it doesn't really look like a sphere, but um, it resembles a sphere. And that's very important because if you give the algorithm total freedom, what you will end up with is something, um, so maybe with a stick. So that stick would, of course, minimize um, the reflection, but it would not be a mirror anymore. So it's of no use. Okay. And I have some other examples that I encourage you um, to go through. Um, these are old examples, so we can't publish or I can't use the, the latest um, results um, that we that we're working on here in that lecture uh, for reasons of confidentiality. But a couple of research directions that could be interesting uh, in the future are here in quantum machine learning, where we look at, for example, linear algebra simulation, least squares regression. That's really interesting. Do it quantumly. In simulation, of course, further optimize material simulation. Maybe at some point work on high temperature superconductivity, so find materials with a quantum computer that can um, that exhibit high temperature superconductivity. That's really interesting. And um, in terms of optimization, um, we see time critical optimization problems uh, as important, such as traffic flow, optimization of materials and robot behavior. Here are some more use cases, um, uh, more specific use cases that I brought. And uh, that's it for the introduction to as to what you can do with quantum computing. And uh, the next lecture will start with uh, the mathematical fundamentals of quantum computing and look into um, the first algorithms in the lecture after the next lecture. Thank you very much for listening in and have a nice remaining day.